Hey guys, welcome. Uh, I'm delighted to bring in Ted Oakley uh, of Oxbow Advisors. Uh, Ted is in the traditional money management uh, business. He simply uh, stated it's in a one-liner stocks, uh, bonds, and cash. Uh, I love the simplicity in that. And wow, what a time to be thinking about allocations. Uh, Ted, you're also working out of Austin, Texas in your money management role. Just give anybody, uh, everybody viewing uh, a little bit of backstory uh, in terms of your history uh, and expertise. Well, you know, Francis, I started on Wall Street uh, almost four decades ago, actually four decades ago, and uh, it really hasn't changed a lot up there than what it is now. I got a pretty good taste of it. Came back to Texas. Uh, we had another private company we sold uh, to Payne Weber back in 1983 and then uh, started my own company with a couple of people. And then Oxbow came around about 25 years ago and we're a money management company, but we uh, we work all over the country, all over, you know, all over the world, really. But we um, we uh, primarily uh, work and do a lot of work with people that have sold companies where they had a liquidity event. And we've written a lot of books, given a lot of speeches about that. But um, but we 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 were really a pretty standard looking group, actually. But we've got a lot of experience, though. Excellent. So you've just cashed out your business and you've got a. Uh, a few million, uh, Ted's going to be your guy. We've got to get straight to this unbelievable market uh, realm that we're in. Um, we've been uh, we've been a bit fighting the buy the dip brigade, uh, suggesting that a number of the major indices, let's go straight into stock, shall we, uh, appear to be in potential reversal structure. So we're kind of macro technical and that uh, things like high yield debt are on the verge of potentially spilling again in light of where the Federal Reserve finds itself right now. Um, in terms of just stocks generally, uh, it, are we in for a bigger fall or should be, everyone be buying the dip? What's your take in terms of allocation right now? On I've got a million dollars. Where do I put it? Well, the thing about the markets right now, Francis, is that, uh, and we have a lot of liquidity in our accounts. All across the board, we probably have 40% uh, liquid right now, in some cases more than that. But the reason being is because things got so extreme in terms of valuations that there was nothing there for us to uh, want to own at the time. And so what we're looking for right now is we think it's, there'll be a continuation of the selling. And it's like most bear markets, you get you you come off, you make a low. People think, ah, this is the low. This is this is it. We're going to turn now. And we've had two or three of these already this year. That's very normal. I suspect we'll have numerous more. Uh, but one of the things we notice, Francis, is that you haven't had any complete. You haven't had any capitulation yet. We find very very few people are actually worried about it. I think I don't know if they think the Fed's going to rescue them or what. But normally, and you got to think about it here, uh, we have all these people in the industry that have been around for you know, 12 to 14 years. They've never, never seen a bear market, not a true bear market that lasts a long time. You know, We have these situations where the Fed came in and, and helped everybody. But I think that's the difference in here. A lot of people are inexperienced with bear markets. I, I actually, uh, totally concur with that. Uh, our, our finding is that uh, we have a spoilt um, generation uh, where the Fed put uh, has, has taken the pain away just as it normally begins to start and that we haven't had a full play out in a very, very lengthy time. I, my investing career began with 87 crash. Uh, you probably got experience on me, but uh, th that's, that, what, that went some way and fell really hard and fast. And of course there were worse ones before that. Um, and it seems to me also in terms of monetary policy, the, there's a license to break. Uh, in other words, there's all this talk about, you know, uh, stimulus seems to be, even you've got Democrats, you've actually got politicians saying, well, we need to curb inflation. So now even, even politicians that love a little bit of largest and pork belly to be shared around uh, are now in the, in, the, in the room where they, they realize that's an election losing position and they, they want to see the Fed be at least somewhat vigilant. How much of it is talk and fluff? How many rates will, cuts will we actually get? And given that they start to materialize and go from possibilities to probabilities to um, bank certainties, uh, how far do we get on the interest rate hiking cycle? And, uh, and within that, this is a bit of a long form question, forgive me, but I think uh, you'll run with it. Um, how much more sensitive are we to even minor uh, interest rate increases uh, in terms of its knock-on effect on risk? 
Well, I think, Francis, one of the things that's happening is people don't remember, we have 90 trillion in total debt in the US if you take government, private, corporations. We've never had that much debt before. And so when you have that much debt, it's easy to say we're going to be like the 70s. Well, we're nothing like the 70s in terms <laughs> of we have so much more debt now yeah. you know, than we had then. So it affects every and everybody, you know, all these all these companies and people and everybody has they got debt, you know, a lot of debt. So we think that's one of the problems they'll have. And from our vantage point, there's no way they can ever get to eight or nine moves. Right. And reason being is because, you know, they usually raise it. Uh, they break some something breaks. We don't know what it is. It's maybe it's overseas. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's, you know, one of the markets. Whatever, but. They forget about the real world. And one of the problems with the Fed is that if you look at their track record, and we've got it really for the last 10 years, it's not very good on their projections. The best projection they have is on interest rates, and that's only about 37% accurate. So all the rest are down around 25% GDP, et cetera. So we don't really, we won't think they have the ability to, to do what they're doing. And so they'll run it in the ground, basically. Um, and I'm sure they're going to go ahead and move a half. I mean, they have too much, you know, jawboning about it for this May meeting and probably do that. But then you take a look at it from there on and more than likely, and, and maybe this doesn't play out this way. I'll say this, if it doesn't play out this way and they keep pressing those rates and really thinking about that November 8th date, which is what they're thinking about um, of election time, then I think you're really in for some serious damage. Um, I doubt we get that far, but if we do and they don't change anything, then you're gonna really have some trouble. So for some of our watchers that are retail, maybe a little bit less familiar with the Fed, we look, we're basically saying a half point, which is 50 basis points, but is likely they've spoken so much about it. It's almost as if 0.75 is almost an, you know, an outlier possibility as well in some people's talking. I'm pretty sure they'll fade on that but they'll go low on that. But let's say we get a half point um, and you were saying roughly eight uh, moves, that would be the next move. So out of the next seven moves, 0.25, which would point to another 2%, I would find that very hard to, for them to deliver. I think you feel the same. Well, I do, Francis, because if you look at it, they've only raised a quarter, but if you look at the bond markets, they've moved eight quarters, <laughs> they, you know, two <laughs> points. So. Yeah, that, we think they've built a lot into it already uh, from that standpoint. And you have to remember, you know, from the standpoint, from a banking standpoint, I own part of, a, a, you know, some private banks. But the, the point about that is that, yes, they get a benefit when rates go up, the banks do. But the flip side of that is the economy slows down and the loans go down. Yeah. So it's not as great as it looks like it is. On that point, apparently uh, there's talk that Amazon, uh, I don't know if they've reported yet or still due to report, but are likely to report a loss for the first time since 2015. Um, some of that's got to do with the rate they were throwing Rivian in, in the last time, which has now felt fallen on harder times, which you probably see them have to uh, eat some red on that one. But uh, it does also point to uh, what Danielle, uh, um, I know a close friend of yours and what someone we spoke to pointed out that you can essentially have an earnings uh, recession because the consumer is broken already. Totally. One of the things about growing up with no money, which I did, is you know what goes on in their minds and you know what goes on Friday to Friday paycheck. And so uh, I get a pretty good feel for that. I mean, I can talk to people and know where they really, really are. A lot of people on Wall Street, they don't have a clue because they're not out there in the hinterland looking at what's happening. But that's what's, if you look at what's going on with people right now, you look at what, you know, number one, the taxes just came out in most states on homes and they're all up like 25 or 30%. They get hit on that. You yes. know, all of a sudden, you know, you've got a 529, 5.29, uh, 30 uh, year mortgage rate. That, that's going to beat that down. You've got that coming. And then profit margins at corporations went an all time high last year, 13.4. They'll never get that high again, in our opinion. We think that's a once in a lifetime move. And so what happens this year is that all that comes in at one time. And when it does, you get into a problem with um, the whole thing breaking down. So I, 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 I think people are not realizing that, uh, that what's coming at them right now. And they, they have this idea that everything will be okay, but 
it doesn't look like that to us really. I love that you brought in housing uh, there and I'm just uh, sharing the screen now and I brought in the 30 year fixed rate mortgage chart just for a point of reference uh, and the, the momentum at which rates have changed. It's not just the fact that they're changing, but it's the violence of this. Um, it was our assessment post um, the events of March 2020 that uh, described as the pandemic um, that we actually had a, a in our view, very early we came in and said, May, we think that's the end for the, the 40 year uh, bull. We were very early and most people disagreed with us. Um, but it was, you mentioned something very early on and you said, we haven't had a final capitulation. We were, you were referring to equities. And for us, yields on debt had a final capitulation during the uh, CB19 uh, period. And the snapback, um, that we're now seeing has got that freshness of new trend in the opposite day, your opposite way, um, and that real reversal momentum. And uh, I would just bring a very practical chart to many people, bond markets, they don't understand them. Debt can be a bit boring, um, but they do understand what they pay in America for their fixed 30 year rates. And seeing this change from, you know, essentially we're at a low at 2021 of around uh, 2.64, and you're now 5.11 and going like a steam train. The knock on wealth effect of the almost near doubling 80% increase uh, in uh, payments for purchasing property. There's two great ATMs, I suppose, that uh, American consumers like to withdraw on, and that's against a strong stock portfolio where they have wealth effect and against their homes. Um, how much? natural tightening are we seeing just with that reduced wealth effect and the knock-on multipliers like that that are going to see us in our view and I think in yours not see the Fed get too much further before we see real real consumer stress. Well you know Francis 70% uh, of the mortgages out there are under four percent let's just say they're three and three quarter on average and they're probably less than that actually so if you think about that 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 dramatically slows the mobility of what's going to go on here. Because if I'm going to sell a home with a mortgage that I have that let's say it's three and a quarter, and now I'm looking at five and a quarter uh, for a much more expensive home, you can see how that changes the mobility of what's going on, which also people don't realize, you know, housing, 27% of GDP. I yeah. mean, you get it slowing down and you're going to have an impact as it goes along. And I think, and what happens is, and again, you know, Wall Street never understands this, but the person out here that's two earner family, you know, living week to week, that sort of thing. When you get a move in gasoline prices and you get a move in mortgage rates and you get a move in food prices, all of a sudden they are saying, hey, you know what? I mean, it just looked recently, Whirlpool came out and said, hey, it's slowing down. They're not buying as many appliances. Yeah. You, you, there, I could give you four or five companies just in the last two weeks that said, hey, and they were right in the middle of this. And they're saying, you know, uh, it doesn't look all that good for us for the next, it looks like it's gonna flatten out here. So I think that's the thing you're going to run into and people are just not used to that. And I love that you bring in Whirlpool, just in case some of the viewers missed that. It's obviously gonna be a key indicator for uh, new home purchases because it's a, uti a uh, utility that's gotta go into new homes. Uh, so if they're reporting, it's almost a lead indicator on uh, sales numbers dropping uh, in the property market. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I did uh, bring up just quickly the, I suppose, let's go back to the share screen, the, the bond market. How could this be? You know, we, we feel maybe, and I'm always concerned when I feel unnaturally confident about something. Certainty is death in the markets. Um, but in our, this is quite an annotated chart, so I'll just take down my scribbles. You might not uh, feel comfortable with that level of artwork. Um, but uh, if you have a look at this uh, iShares 20 year bond ETF, could we be looking at something that is pointing to a longer term? And yes, there'll be deflation hits along the way, which could indeed uh, bring rallies in the bond market. We can't forget that. And uh, something else you, you mentioned when we were still on equities, Sometimes the harshest rallies can be in when you haven't yet found the bottom as well in bear markets. So those up moods can be quite violent and then they can stop in their tracks and uh, reassert down. But do you think um, we've reached peak bonds uh, in uh, the events of, uh, what was it, uh, March 2020? Well, I said yesterday in our research meeting, which we have every Tuesday, I said, look, 
we're going to probably get a fairly violent rally on the upside in the bonds. But you have to look at that rally and look and see if you if you get that move, let's say you get a move back from, you know, two, it was 290, whatever the number was, 294, 295. We're 278 today. Let's say you take it back to 225 or something. And then you look at that and say, but it doesn't look like things are really changing. In other words, you still have, you know, some deep-seated inflation. You still have the Fed really pushing it. Um, I think at that point on that rally, you have to decide how many bonds you want to keep. Now, we have a lot of short paper. I'm talking about less than two years. Yes. So it's not going to affect us that much. We have a little bit of long paper, not a lot. I'd say 10% in a bond account. But um, but if it looks like it's not going to hold and you're going to be in that situation, I find one thing in the, in the investment business that I had to learn the hard way is that I need to be able to change my point of view. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I learned that the hard way by thinking that, uh, uh, that I was right about something and then I got drilled into the ground. That was years ago. I learned that the hard way. So I don't hold a hard case here other than the fact I'm open to the to two ways they can go but I think if you get a recession then the bond market is going to rally for some time yeah. if you get a recession if you don't get a recession you may get a rally but it won't last you know and you'll go the other way but I do think that um, even if you had a big rally in the bonds back to some really low number again let's say the tenure went back to one percent or something in my opinion, that's probably the last time. In other words, after that, um, you know, the Fed will have used up so much of what they've done over the last 25 years that uh, from then on, you need to really be pretty agile in what you do with bonds. Yeah. So uh, I agree that uh, I think they're going to break it badly. Uh, and that will be supportive uh, for bonds. It's kind of, um, we talk about these polarities, and I don't know if you'll comment on this. There's the inflation trade, which is short debt, uh, long gold, long all the commodities, which we've largely had play out now, that is po probably facing its first corrective um, minor, what I think could be a correction in a rally. However, if we break really badly, as you suggested, you could actually have the, the debt market come back some way. Um, but that, that this has been uh, a form of turning. That's, I suppose, if I were to describe our house view that we've held for a while, and it's continued to be uh, endorsed by current market activity. The thing is, with equities going down and bonds going um, down in capital value, and essentially only something really bad happening likely to pump it, is it the, and given what you've said, that it's probably the final rally is it something that people should uh, really be considering or should they be removing debt from their lives? What are the risks of out and out? You mentioned 90 trillion. P pay any form of an interest rate on that and it's, uh, it's unbelievably large. God forbid uh, the opaqueness of the derivative markets and who's reliant on who in this debt environment uh, and the magic circle, what ring a ring a roses, I call it, one falls, they all go down. Um, it does sound like we could be looking at jubilees and, and, and almost an entire new uh, financial system. And then you have the larger narrative of central bank digital currencies being uh, in the lab, uh, worked in the back room. Um, could, could we be startled by what eventually ends up getting unpacked and the world uh, takes a, a quantum leap or a transition of some level in the next break moment? I have a feeling that we, are, we, we might face something far larger that comes out of this. The Frankenstein might emerge uh, of the new uh, structured economy. Do you have any views on some of those things on the more periphery, like the planning on central bank digital uh, currencies? Is that, is that in the works? Will it be part of the next uh, sell-off or do we still need to go a few more rounds? No, I, I, I think they're, I don't think they're ready for a digital currency. I don't think they got to have the ability right now to put it in place like you would have wanted. And I, I do think, you know, what happens with the Fed too is they push, it's like you were talking about 87. And if you remember in 87, Greenspan wanted to be the next Volcker. So he was pressing those rates all along. And uh, what really happened is people just said, you know what, I can get X amount over the treasury market. So I'm gone from the stock market. Yeah. And he broke it, see? So, and, and that's what they tend to do. This break to me will come from this standpoint. The average person 
has maximum wealth in their real estate and maximum wealth in their equities. And I'm talking about a two sigma event, probably two standard deviations above what it should be. That means that to come back to the norm on real estate and stocks and bonds, you have to have a fairly sizable correction. And what that does to people, at least in my opinion, it does this to them, is they were like, it was much, it was much like um, 08 was. I remember people talking about or 04 when 03 when people had gone through these bear markets and they said, gosh, I was, you know, I was all set to retire. I had it right, everything was good had the right amount of money, blah, blah, blah. And now I've got to go back to work. Well, I think that happens again, but I think it'll be tougher real estate market this time. I think we're so far extended uh, in residential real estate that when it comes back to sort of back to earth, that a lot of people are going to have trouble with that. Slightly underwritten though, maybe. Uh, yeah, I totally agree on, in, on overvaluations. And I think the same for tech equity, particularly, but equity general but possibly slightly underwritten when they go back to some form of stimulus by the input costs and the deglobalization. Uh, just thinking in terms of lumber and new build, eventually, once you get the overhang cleared out, no new projects come out because developers can't make money uh, because of the input costs, um, labor costs as well, that'll also climb. Um, but I do think you're right. I do think it, there's plenty scope for um, that to occur. How, how, what could we see on uh, equities? I'll bring up a couple of uh, the key indices, if you like. There's Dow, there's NASDAQ, um, while, we, while we're chatting. Have you done anything aggressive? Uh, I mean, are you holding any short positions or puts or any portfolio in insurance or are you just up choosing to be not overly allocated to equities well in the in the, we only have one equity account uh we have a, a we have a conservative income account that is basically bulletproof uh and then we have a, a what we call an aggressive income account it's not bonds it's everything but bonds but it's high it's what we call a high income but in the equity side we're um we're about 30, uh, 33, 34% cash. And then we have about a 7% or so, six to 7% position in the, in the short S&P. Yeah. Only because we have some gains in some companies that we would rather just have a short side hedge as opposed to selling those and paying the tax and then trying to come back because they're good companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we're about, but if you take all of that in, it's about 41% roughly on the equity side. We usually never go past 50, but I, I, I think we've had our best years if, that we've ever had have been 2003, 2009. Why is that? Not because we're geniuses, we just happen to have a lot of liquidity at a low. And so when you've got liquidity, you can press that money in and that's where you make the most money at that time. So we don't look at the sell-offs as we're not particularly super negative. We think there's some be some real opportunity actually when it finally is all said and done. Yeah. Um, but but I think it comes at us here in the next uh, really two to four months, two to five months, not the end of the year, but soon. Yeah, you know, we, we always a bit cautious about uh, calling uh, shorts on US indices. Uh, as well. And mm -hmm. even on this sell off here, there is a bit of a bid buy up. Uh, we call that candle wick. Let me put it in right. the link, uh, on the, that capitulation at that possible neckline. And also today, it seems we're getting a little bit of buying coming in. <coughs> so it's possible there's a, there's a bit of support in and around the 33,000 uh, mm -hmm. level. It might mean that any capitulation for now, a lot has already been priced in. People need to remember, I suppose, as the, the old adage that uh, the equity market is pricing in six months ahead. And in actual fact, given how tough the Fed has talk, uh, spoken, may already have priced in a fair bit. Uh, and if they under deliver on some of that, there may even be some degree of relief rally in terms of people adjusting their models um, to be slightly less uh, bearish on uh, or hawkish on the interest rate side. Um, Okay, you mentioned bullet. Oh, no. uh, well, I was going to say this to you. You had the Dow up there, but if you look at the Dow, is sort of a uh, it's sort of camouflaged because uh, it hit a low of you know thirty two six or whatever back in the early part of March. Now, if you take the S and P five hundred and New York Stock Exchange, for example, they're right on their low, and so when they break that. Um, we think you get a lot more selling. And the same way with the Dow, when you go under that 32.6, all of a sudden people will be like, 
Oh gosh, see the NASDAQ's already done that. Yeah. They're, they're lower than they were um, in that March low. So you're right down on those. Anything that goes wrong now will be exaggerated because you're going to be in a situation where everybody that bought stocks the last say 15 months will be underwater. And yeah. so yeah. that's where you head from there. So, but if you look at those and I can't, what you have up there now, I think is the S&P 500, but you see how it's really close to that same spot it was back in yes. March. Yeah. And when you break that through that, all of a sudden, then you go in, you, then you're going into a different spot. And I think, I think that's where we are. It may not be today or tomorrow, but I think it's coming. Yes. Uh, I, I mentioned this with uh, Daniel and I'm interested in your take too. The, the tendency for equity buybacks by a large amount of the indices, that has also been on borrowed money. Um, and that of course reduces the amount of dividends that have to be paid externally to shareholders. Uh, so it was almost deemed that loan equity was cheaper than debt equity for a while. Now we're seeing the swing in um, interest rates. Uh, are a few real, real chickens going to come home to roost for a number of equities that are um, that have been putting the, the pig's snout a little too deep in the trough there on the the, the leveraged uh, the leverage to repurchase stock? What's your take on that one? Well, I'm going to be blunt with you here, uh, Francis. I think that. Uh, the buyback idea is one of the biggest shams we've ever had on Wall Street. And I'll tell you why. I can go back and give you many companies, many companies in the S&P 500, that if you look at their raw sales and bottom line numbers, they're the same or lower than they were seven or eight years ago. And what these companies have done, and they've let you know the public, the mutual, everybody's let them get away with it, including the SEC. But what happens is, they bought back all this stock and all they do is turn it back into upper management. And you look at the average CEO who's been around five years, okay, they make their hundred mil and give it to their next crony that comes up. And it is one of the worst things that's ever come about because all of a sudden you've taken and you've done this financial engineering yeah. that's yeah. ruined what really goes on. You'd never run a private company like that. No, no, no. way. You're not going to take somebody from the outside and say, hey, we'll just let you, we'll just cut down the number of shares so you can get a lot in your pocket. And, you know, they keep coming out. I see people come up with these ideas that, oh, it's good, better use of capital. But hey, how about a better use of capital? Give me the money, pay it to me as a shareholder. I'll take it and yeah. use, use the capital that way. That, that whole Wall Street jargon, it won't fly with us, but it doesn't go away either. But if you look the last 10 years, it's, that has been a major impact on the markets. In fact, there's a phrase uh, called the control fraud uh, that you're probably familiar with, where you know management actually has the, the agency problem, as they refer to it, where the, there's more interest in self -enrich enrichment than the interests of the company. Everybody's on the same remuneration committee, cross holdings in the big equities that are doing this, and they they have this stretch number for a super cash out on options, as you mentioned. They make they come out centi millionaires. Um, and then they chase up that stock on uh, cheap debt and then say, look at the great job I've done. Um, there's a guy called Simon Black that was comparing Coca-Cola of 10 or 12 years ago with Coca-Cola today. And on every single metrics, it was significantly worse, much higher debt, lower earnings, lower growth rates, lower general turnover, uh, higher cost. Um, and it was about 3x uh, the share price. And, and this is just financial engineering. And uh, it does feel that this is the, it's coming close to a debt reckoning on so many levels, not just the consumer right. who's facing, uh, uh, Daniel mentioned that people are extending mortgages on this rate so that they can get a little bit of extra cash and that the, the effective rate that they're paying is 22% because they're going from their three and a half, four percent 4% fixed to refi at five. Um, just to get that extra 10% uh, of cash, uh, people are using credit cards at 16%. Um, so the consumer is clearly making, I would say, not very pragmatic uh, cost of money decisions, but we've got plenty of corporate malfeasance that needs to be washed out. And to me, I'm very much similar to you. I mean, I don't think, uh, I think a South African and a Texan get on just fine because they talk blunt. <laughs> Uh, all the time, um, and that 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 does seem like captured uh, crony capitalism rather than uh, the true price discovery mechanism that we all so want and love. Do you have any uh, pet 
favorites in that? Any, uh, maybe as your company would not be the shorting variety, but who would you say is the biggest sinners? Um, who, who, do you, who do you get a twitch, a nervous twitch every time you see their stock symbol come up for those kind of um, uh, misbehaviors or would you rather not say? I don't want to put you, you under well, any pressure. Here's the thing, if you take, you know, we look at the top 200, 250 companies, the S&P 500, and really all of them fit into the basket. Yeah. And the, the other thing that bothers us about that, people probably don't realize this, but the average director gets just a little less than 300 grand a year for making whatever meetings I make, plus some stock. And naturally they're gonna be on the comp committee or whatever committee they're gonna do, whatever they're told. And so you see, it's a racket. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we've gotten into here. Uh, and people really are, I think people are afraid to, to talk, uh, talk about it and really say what it really is, but that's, that's, that's where we are today. And the only thing that solves that, I will tell you what solves it, hard times. When yeah. you have hard times and you, you, you can't come in and say, okay, well, you know, when your business is actually falling, sales are going down, you, you, you can't come in and say, well, we're gonna buy back the stock because that's gonna help. Well, that won't do you any good for sales. <laughs> so yeah. that's where we're headed to right now. Talking about uh, uh, some of the people that have maybe been not doing their job. Um, last year, well, last major financial crisis, I'd de describe it as a depression. I did then and I will still do it today. But the, what's known as the, the Great Recession, the GFC, uh, which is code for not wanting to admit it was a depression until it's long gone in history, uh, in my opinion. Um, we had uh, ratings agencies that were very much not doing their job in terms of collateralized debt obligations in the subprime era. Um, are they doing their job on the true value? Because this is HYG, which is junk. Uh, and we have a pensions crisis. We have a boomer demographic. And we have a lot of companies uh, and almost a huge shelf that are just above the, the debt ratings. Are they doing their job? Should not some of that uh, already be falling into the debt pile? Is it to sustain the system at the cost of actually doing what they were there to do? Well, uh, you know, there used to be an old show on called Truth or Consequences. And uh, uh, one of the uh, things I found is that if you look at HYG or you look at JNK and you go in and look, we would, ne we would never own them. But yeah. if you go, we own straight bonds, we never own an ETF. But if you look at the, if you look at the bonds inside, um, almost 30% of those or a third of those, they don't trade. They never trade. You can imagine if everybody showed up and said, I want to get liquid today in HYG. Yeah. Where do we go from there? You know, and right now, yeah, they've had some selling, but they could get some serious selling if yeah. the companies come unwound on you because of some of those bonds won't trade and, yeah. uh, you know, you can't get a bid for them. So, we haven't gotten to that point yet. That's what we keep coming. Yeah, we've gotten some selling and they're down for the year, et cetera. But, but I, we have not seen the point to where people, you know, they've had people have had two or three really good years. And so they're like, well, you know, I can be down some, but let them get down 30 or 40. It's a different tune. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think what you're saying is quite accurate. People always think market price is a guide for what they'll get out for. Um, until you test the liquidity and it's vaporware. It's almost, you can almost have these minor altcoin uh, crypto market event, uh, similarities in some of these debt markets on just a slightly more scaled version thereof. Uh, if a whole bunch of people try to hit the exit at the cinema as someone screams fire at the same time. There's actually been quite a long lengthy delay between the volatility on the bond market and the debt markets and that coming through on equities. In fact, I did a chart. I might still have it here. It seems equities didn't want to believe um, that that was the case. Um, and let's just see if we got that. There was on the, uh, I was looking at the market here. Uh, sorry, it's too far back. I'll leave it for now. But it was, there was quite a credibility gap in terms of the volatility. And it seems that the, the equity volatilities only really kind of got started while the bond volatility is deep into, um, you know, quite, quite a high level that hasn't been seen in a while. So does this not also point to just uh, further risk uh, onto the downside on the, the equity side? There should be some closing of the gap maybe. Well, I think, Francis, it does catch up. Uh, you know, one of the things we find right now is that, and, and that's why I was saying, you haven't had people get scared enough to say, just 
sell it. I want out. You know, you're getting you're getting some selling, but you're not getting the kind. What what you look for, you know, look at it this way. Last Thursday or Friday was the first day the put call ratio had gone over a hundred, uh, and and that's um you know, and that's after the selling. Everything went on. And normally that that's just the beginning of people starting to get worried a little bit. But after that, after you see them worried for a month or two, then it starts to show up in the pricing. And that's why I was saying, if you look at these averages that you've had up there and they're right on those levels of, of, of where you break it from there and all of a sudden you get a full whole new wave of selling because I, I looked, you know, last year you had more money come in according to Bloomberg uh, they came in the equity markets then the whole 19 years prior to that. That was a Bloomberg article that came out here a few months ago. Yeah. That being the case, that means at this stage right now, everybody that bought last year is losing money. <laughs> so right. we'll see how long they can take it. But normally, you know, the average person can't take it because they don't have any liquidity. They can't stand it. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree and concur with that. Um, I'm going to take you into maybe a few areas you weren't so comfortable with, but I think you will still have a very interesting view. Um, I was kind of curious on um, the dollar. We feel the dollar's got more to go. Um, it's had an unbelievable run, but I think it's going to shock people with how sustained uh, how sustained it is. And we feel that in the dollar index, believe it or not, and in fact, we've been saying this for a long time, so it's less laughable now than it uh, has been, but we feel 111 will run. Um, and that there's kind of um, there's uh, there's kind of a uh, for want of a better word a dollar shortage internationally, and there's huge problems coming in as a result of the yen uh, capitulation that's rolling into the Korean won, and uh, there's going to be competitive devaluation there in Asia uh, because China's been actually trying to kill its property problem, so the the yuan has started to actually soften. Um, and that actually that one of the most uh, interesting markets, although it's not in your asset management, but may have knock on effects for your um, money management portfolios, is uh, a, a period of relative dollar strength to other in this fear period. I started to discuss the inflation where it's essentially short debt and long the commodities, which is now essentially probably facing a bit of a rest. But the fear side, we're going to pivot between the two until the stimulus comes back in, then we're back on the inflation side. Um, the fear side seems to lean on a strong uh, dollar. Uh, some will go into treasuries to stop the capitulation, but I think not to the same levels as before. Um, and some might just go into other dollar-based assets like cash. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think what else goes up in this fear period. And I think a lot of it will be carried in the currencies and a lot of offshore investment might be being pulled out because this, when we see the Korean one, for example, losing and it's just crossed a critical level that it hasn't done a long time, we see the cost be selling off. So that points to sort of um, maybe American holders of cash repatriating. When there's fear, it seems everything comes home to America um, for that international uh, investor. If we were to get a sustained period of strength uh, taking you through triple one and beyond on the dollar index. Um, what's the world look like for those equity markets? It smells of a fear trade uh, for me. And that probably points to a lot of things off, but not to put words in your mouth. How does, how does the world look at a dollar index of triple one? You're talking about a euro crash, a yen crash further, a euro possibly running parity is, that, is in our house view, uh, yen going through 136 into heading for 140s, that kind of a world. Do you, uh, in terms of that, big FX and debt market. What does it look like for equities, bonds, uh, and your clients? Well, I think from the standpoint of the dollar, I, you know, there's two different schools of thought on it. And some people think that, you know, for example, with Russia saying, hey, if we're gonna sell you gas, you gotta pay for it in rubles, you can't pay for it in dollars. And that sort of, there's all of that going on too. However, when you get right down to it, uh, there's only, you know, when things get like they are now, uh, you can say what you want to about the dollar and yeah, we have troubles in the US, but the main point is, is that when times are like they are now, they have to go to a currency that they can trust for the time being. That doesn't mean long-term it'll be the greatest yeah. thing ever, but I think in the, when I say the short run, a year or two, you're, you have to feel like the dollar. Think about it, you know, the yuan is only 3% of, you know, 3% 3, 3 of currency reserves, they're nothing. 
And then you've got these other currencies breaking down on you and the small currencies for sure. And I think people, I think the only drawback for the dollar has been maybe the fact that uh, when they seized um, you know, the, the reserves for Russia it made people think, well, I, I'm surprised they can take my money. I yeah. don't think that'll have a long-term effect because I think people will still look to say, okay, what, which currency can I be safe in right here? Because if everything falls apart, who has the capacity really to keep their currency intact? And that's why the dollar uh, comes out in that sort of look. Now, we don't own, uh, we don't own anything in Europe, certainly don't own anything in China. China looks lower to us too as well. And so uh, we're, we're sort of not in, in that, that look. Um, we used to own, uh, uh, for a few years, we owned some Australian bonds. We don't own that now either. So. Uh, we're we we feel like that will keep the dollar okay from the you know for the time being. But I am inclined to agree. It's not it's not an endorsement of the dollar, but it, it's just the you've had since the forty end of the World War II. You've got such developed markets, wholesale markets, the euro dollar markets, and all of that. You don't replace that in a second. You stay with the system that you know people aren't going to uh, want to hold you on and be at the whim of. Uh, you know, the, the, the a communistic uh, government uh, and any uh, diktats they might come up with. So they'll stay with the devil they know, I think, um, which, which, is, which is certainly interesting. Um, I, I would, uh, had a little look at um, Russia, it's, it's just internationalizing a bit. I looked at JP Morgan's Russia fund um, and it fell off a cliff and the PEs on Russia for energies are ridiculously low. Um, Give me any reasons why I shouldn't be uh, potentially fishing for uh, low exposure to Russia, or would you be sy sympathetic? As someone who's pretty domestic, US domestic, um, would you consider um, things like the energy assets, given the credibility gap between Green's ability to actually deliver um, on the Green agenda and the period that we're still going to be relying on um, oil, coal, uh, and even more so uh, uranium, which is nuclear power, which is the cleanest of the old energies, if we can say that. Um, what's your take uh, on an international look like that uh, on Russia? Well, I think, you know, from us, we don't, we don't own Russia. Uh, if I were somebody, anytime I get into an area that I don't know anything about, and I'm going to speculate with it, yeah. um, anytime I get into that type of situation, I, uh, I tend to go really low, like low percentage. I'll, I'll put maybe, you know, one or 2% in something, but, um, and it's really, that's such a heated type situation that I'm not certain how that's going to really come out in the long run. But um, I think we're in a position where we wouldn't do it necessarily, but I'm not saying that, um, that uh, somebody couldn't make some money doing it because They've taken, if you look at a lot of the things that are over there right now, like the, uh, the biggest bank in Russia is like trading for nothing. Yeah. And, you know, you, I would say if, uh, it's not something we do. It's not our expertise. So I, I can't comment too much on it other than the fact that if I were doing it, it would be for a real small percentage. Yeah, oh, good money management and all of that uh, taken. And that's very sound comment. Um, which, who do you think is are your bulletproof stocks? Uh, I can pull them up for you if you like. Uh, I won't put you on the spot on who the dogs are, but uh, who, do you, who do you like to hold that's defensive in the kind of climate that we're facing? So we're talking about earnings recessions, mm -hmm. highly defensive. Are you, are you going to have utilities in there? Um, where, where are you going to be? Uh, what, what's a, a core holding that you like? Well, uh, I'll, I'll just give you some names that we, and we have, I'm going to break it down so you see kind of what we have. But if you look at the most conservative portfolio we have, most of the, most of our, um, most of our maturities in there are less than 48 months. Now, what we found recently, though, is that um, in the muni market at two year and three year paper and, and even the treasuries, they're so much higher than they were two years ago that we're really getting some nice rates there. Also in that account, we own uh, about 6% in gold. Uh, We're gonna ask we, about that, that's fascinating. So you've, yeah. you are going for the portfolio insurance of gold, which could of course sell off in a deflationary environment, Good. but it's quite likely to make it back up on the longer term. I think people have gotten frustrated with it um, because it keeps going between, you know, 
1900 or 1910 and up around 1980, 1990. And so they're like frustrated with the pricing. Um, uh, but eventually we think it comes around. Now on the, on the, 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 on the things that we really like though, we like the miners and we like particularly like, uh, we like the situations where we can get uh, we can we can basically get royalties. Like if you look at Franco Nevada, we own um, on the oil royalty side, we own a brig of minerals. Uh, there's two or three of those you could own. That's what we own. Um, we own uh, some fertilized. We own a lot of different things in that game. But we also own, like for example, we own a Nextera utility, but we own a convertible preferred, and it's the best of both worlds. We get a lot. Of, we get a higher dividend than we would in the common but we can convert it into the common. And it just sold off the last three or four days because um, basically some solar panels and things like that that were coming from China are coming, coming in, not necessarily from China, but they're coming in, they're slowing down. And yeah. for us then to get the panels themselves, we, we like that type of thing. If you look, we, we like the REITs. People don't realize that real estate investment trusts, if they're run correctly, are fairly decent inflation hedges. Oh, Unlike... Yeah. A bond because if I own a piece of real estate, I can raise the rent, yeah. and I, and I will, yeah. and so it may affect them for a while, and people will sell sell them off. But you know, we own if you if you look at, um, you know, uh, if, if we we own you know two or three different uh, medical reads, we like that area quite a bit. We you know if you look at um, on the stock side, we we're we're almost 50 percent liquid and we've got we have some stocks that have done really well for us over the years we're just not buying them right now yeah and we still hold pieces of them but if you look at you look at things we own like you know microsoft united health o'reilly automotive things that we think like uh, for example you're going to need no, no matter what uh, as you go through here in a bad time but we also look for things that are paying you know we want things that are paying some fairly nice cash flow um, on the gas pipeline side, you know, we, we like enterprise products. Um, you know, we, we like basically MPLX, which is the old marathon lines, but these are things where you're getting seven and a half, eight percent pays on a K1. So you don't, it's like a piece of real estate. Um, we mix all that together really to come up with a, with a fairly diversified portfolio and not you know, so many portfolios today, if I go in and pull off a growth portfolio, I bet I could pull a hundred of them out, branches, and they would all look alike, yeah. you know, and, and ours is not like that. It's, it's highly diversified into different areas. Um, when, when you put it all together, most of our investors will have some money in all three of those strategies so that something is working all the time. Not everything, but something. Yeah. So it allows us to, uh, have a year like this year where we're really in pretty good shape. I mean, we're not, you know, we had so much liquidity and so many, uh, so many other things that it, that it helped us out quite a bit. We're not perfect, um, but we've been here before. Yes, I like that you've been here before. Uh, and I like that great years were 2009 and 03 for many, the post.com US had a recession that was bottoming around about 02, 03. Um, that's great if you can be the outlier performer in the defensive in the defensive times because I think you sound like the money management for our era right now. Uh, well, you know, uh, we lost accounts in '99 because we wouldn't buy. We sold our last tech, oh, uh, in in early '99. So the last tech stock, and so yeah. we lost accounts because they said, "Hey, well, if you're not going to own tech, it was much like we lost accounts back in '89." because we didn't own Japan. <laughs> People yeah. said, well, you got to own Japan. If you're not going to own Japan, we're going to fire you. And so that happened. And interesting enough, it happened again in 2021. We had people that said, hey, you know, you're just not, you just don't understand what the game is here. Yeah. And um, we want that run and gun. And, and yeah, you know, that works for a while. It does work for a while. But um, in the long run, you've got to own companies that, you know, that make money, pay cash flow, pay dividends, you know, just like you buy a private business. Cash flow is going to become very sexy again. What was dull and it was all go, go growth. Suddenly the cash flow era companies are going to be the ones that are going to be uh, respected again. I have a feeling. And I think uh, it sounds like you're positioned for that. I've got planes all American on here. Did you have a view on them as a pipeline? You mentioned oil pipeline companies. Technically, I quite like it. And it hasn't really recovered in the manner mm -hmm. that oil has recovered yet. 
but this is uh, at a technical level commentary only. I'm not a uh, fundamental master of it. Um, the, well, it's interesting, sort of interesting you say that. We own the, we own the, uh, a few things we own the, the limited partner in, and they pay on a K1. On planes, we, we do own some of the general partner, which is about the same dividend. It's just not a deferred dividend like it would be in the limited partnership. Planes really cleaned up the balance sheet a number of years ago. They have some excellent lines. Uh, I think people probably don't understand that they have some really fine, uh, fine uh, distribution lines. And when I, I say that, I mean true lines in the ground. And so um, planes probably will do well. Uh, I think people will look at that and say, you know, as we go forward, uh, I, I would have no problem owning. We don't own the limited partnership, but we own the general partner, the PAGP, which is, which is about the same dividend. Um, but you don't, you don't pay it. You don't have a K one on it. You just have a cash, you have a cash dividend, but, um, I see what you have up there in the graph continuing, uh, because number one, I think the companies, you know, with this group we have in Washington now, they don't want you to build any more pipelines. <laughs> and so yeah. if you have pipelines, it's almost like the railroads, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't build any more. It's hard to build a railroad track now. Um, you can build a few short hauls, but not much. And so it's the same way they're putting the pressure down. So if you have lines in the ground and you have to remember all those have easements and everything, that's a valuable asset to you. Yeah. So they're, shut, you they're shutting doors on that, aren't they? It's almost like uh, if you got through the door, you, you're lucky you, you won't be able to get it again in this current environment um, near as easily. And God knows what the cost would be to lay it down as well uh, with, with commodity prices being where they are just throwing concrete pipes down um and buying the land uh yeah that's so yeah it's nice uh we, we're watching this one as an equity of interest for us in fact we traded it to the short side prior oil uh collapse um but it, it's now it, i mean it traded as low as three dollars which i'm pretty sure you would love to have had a lot of it and it's at 10 and i i could see this doing um going north of uh 20 again uh possibly more but we might it might have to survive what's coming our way um, in terms of uh, the deflationary risk. Um, it's been awesome talking to you, Ted. Uh, final parting shot comment on how you would uh, tell people to position. And then I'd love you just to tell people also at the back end of that, how they can get in touch with you if they'd like to talk further, uh, particularly our US following. Um, you're gonna get a domestic orientated policy, not much international risk, not much currency risk. Um, but tell us, yes, uh, any, how would you, any, any general comments of wisdom for our uh, retail investor that is following? And some of them will be from all over the world. Some of them will be American. Uh, how, you, how you see this play out uh, and then how to contact you? Well, I would say to the individual investor out there that uh, as long as your dinner parties, you're discussing that I think this is the bottom and it, lo it looks okay, that probably it isn't. Now, when you go back to those <laughs> dinner parties and everybody is just completely wiped out, then you might have a bottom. You might be in that position. But for the individual, I don't think you can't put enough emphasis on having some liquidity, some cash right now. I mean, what happens to the individual investor the most is this. They stay fully invested. They don't have, they're not like somebody that has $100 million. They can, you know, no big deal to lose 10. But for them, you know, they stay fully invested. They get to a low in the market and it goes lower and lower and lower. It finally gets what I call the choking point. And I, one of the books I wrote called Your Money Mentality was about that. I said, hey, you got to know yourself where that choking point is because if you get to a low in the market and you don't have any liquidity, and I'm talking about the ability to survive the next two or three or four years and not lose everything, then it's going to make you make the wrong decisions. And so liquidity will help you emotionally keep it together. And that's what you have to do in investing is keep it together. But <clears throat> I appreciate you having me on. If you want to get in contact with us, the best place is really at the website, oxboyadvisors.com. And um, really, we have um, a lot of books on there we've written. And you'll see um, our, our market letters that come out. Uh, we just had one come out here a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, but <clears throat> it's all available there if you'd like to look at it. And you know, um, I've really enjoyed visiting with you. I, I, uh, I love the way you look at things, Francis. 
Thank you, Ted. It's very kind. Uh, cash is king. Uh, when we're in a falling market, those opportunities will come. Wait for one more cycle of pain. Some really sound, sound uh, investment advice from a man who's been there in the trenches for many a decade. Ted Oakley uh, of Oakley, uh, my apologies, of uh, Oxbow Advisors. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, look forward to tweeting this out uh, as well uh, so that all your followers can uh, get your latest view. Um, thanks very much, Ted, and we will uh, no doubt hopefully speak again soon. All right, Francis. Thank you.